COVID-19 runs rampant as the European continent faces the prospect of a bleak winter. The World Health Organization is warning of a spike in cases across the region as opinion is sharply divided on whether to impose new restrictions. I'm Jafar Hasnan and today's newsmaker is the coronavirus resurgence. Now, we have been in a pandemic for more than 18 months, and yet, despite all of our knowledge and vaccinations, cases of COVID-19 have been increasing in Europe for a third consecutive week. Officials are warning of a renewed health crisis. The United Kingdom, Russia and Germany are some of the worst affected in the region. Around 50 million Russians are vaccinated, but the country has reported a record number of new infections and deaths. The rapid rise prompted authorities to reintroduce a lockdown in Moscow starting next week. Germany has reported more than 17,000 new cases for the first time since May. And the United Kingdom now has one of the highest daily infection rates in the world, crossing 50,000 cases. There are growing calls to reimpose restrictions, but the British Prime Minister Boris Johnson insists the government will stick with its plan and is instead encouraging citizens to get a booster shot. Well, we're continuing with the, the plan that uh, we set out in, in July, which was an ex itself a, an extension of the, of the roadmap that began in, in February. And yes, we're watching the numbers very carefully uh, every day. Um, and yes, you're, you're absolutely right, Tracy, the, the, the numbers of infections are high, um, but we're within the parameters of what the predictions were. While cases are soaring in rich European nations, despite their high vaccination rate, most people in third world nations are yet to receive a first dose. At the same time, the World Health Organization says 240 million doses are lying unused in the West. The UN Health Agency is calling on high income nations, which have received the vast majority of vaccines, to step up their donations to countries where vaccinations lag behind that by December on current projections, the West will be stockpiling 600 million unused vaccines, and by February, almost a billion, that could, starting today, if airlifted to the South, help prevent the loss of lives. To have the vaccines available in one half of the world, and yet to deny them to the other half of the world, is one of the greatest international public policy failures imaginable. And it's a moral catastrophe of historic proportions that will shock future generations. Now, vaccine inequality has no doubt cost countless lives. And some of the most affected members of society have been health workers on the front lines. On average, just 40% of health professionals are fully vaccinated against COVID-19. And this figure hides huge disparities between regions and economic groups. The World Health Organization's Director General has been insisting the need to be prioritized. In Africa, less than one in 10 health workers have been fully vaccinated. Meanwhile, in most high-income countries, more than 80% of health workers are fully vaccinated. A new WHO working paper estimates that 115,000 health workers may have died from COVID-19 between January 2020 and May this year. So who is responsible for the gross inequality in the poorest state of pandemic globally? Can anyone be held accountable for the millions of COVID-19 deaths? Well, in Brazil, the Senate is accusing the president of personally failing to protect people. A congressional panel there has recommended that President Jair Bolsonaro be indicted for crimes against humanity for the country's death toll of more than 600,000 people. The report is the culmination of a six-month investigation into how the president's failed policies allowed the deadly virus to spread. Bolsonaro has denied any wrongdoing and his supporters say the report is politically motivated. I'm joined now from Geneva by the spokesperson for the World Health Organization and public health doctor, Margaret Harris. Dr. Harris, it's good to have you with us here on The Newsmaker. Now, Dr. Harris, uh, Almost 18 months 
since the pandemic began. More than 200 million confirmed cases, almost 5 million deaths. You have been the voice of the World Health Organization since the beginning of this pandemic. Tell me what is the current state of the pandemic and what concerns the World Health Organization at this point? Thank you, Jafar, and it's good to be with you and your viewers. We are in a, at a very critical state uh, at the moment. We are seeing uh, a stabilization in the number of cases around the world, except in Europe particularly, where for the third week in a row, we're seeing big rises in cases and sadly also big rises in the number of people dying. Now, the other thing that's really concerning us is that we are going into the winter. That means the, the behaviors that make us more likely to transmit this virus, the crowding together, the um, the being close together, and, and the possibility of getting other viruses, uh, such as influenza. There's another virus called respiratory syncytial virus that's circulating. So we're concerned that the other winter viruses will add to the problems caused by COVID-19 and increase the pressure on the hospitals. Right. Dr. Harris, now I remember when the pandemic began, I had asked you, what do we know about this virus? And you had told me there are many things we don't know about this virus. So tell me, are there still many things that we don't know about uh, when it comes to the coronavirus, COVID-19? Are there still any dark corners? <laughs> Well, certainly, Jeff Aaron, we've certainly had this conversation before. Uh, when you have a new virus, you are constantly learning. And, and frankly, we're always learning about old viruses as well. The, the things I learned as a young doctor are not necessarily wrong, but we've learned much more about every virus because our science is getting better and better. This virus we know, though, and when you talk about dark corners, is very good at changing itself, especially when it gets the chance to transmit, to reproduce in in our populations when we've got large numbers of cases. So even when we don't have, if people are not necessarily sick, if they're transmitting the virus, that virus gets a chance to change itself every time and we know that it's developed the ability to transmit itself more effectively especially the delta virus but what we are worrying about the really dark corner is we don't want to see it develop the ability to to evade the vaccine you know to hide from the vaccine to change itself enough so that the immune protection we've built up with this brilliant vaccines um, could be something that doesn't work so well against a new variant. So we really want to stop the transmission to stop the virus from getting a chance to develop a new and better form of itself. Right. And Dr. Harris, this is certainly one of the main concerns for many of us. Now, what I would like to ask you is what would be your message to our viewers, to the international community as the world health organization first of all understand this virus is very much here the message that some people got was that that somehow this was over this is not over we're right in the middle of the battle and every one of us is a soldier on the front line of that battle how can you be how can you take part you can make sure you wear that mask when you're in a crowded space. You keep your physical distance. You look at your home and your workplace and anywhere else and find ways to ventilate it properly. Don't go into a room that's crowded. And if you're, if you, if you're being asked to work in a place like that, you need to speak to your employers and say, this is not acceptable. We need, and employers need to look at their workers and make sure that they can work safely. We, the virus is transmitting itself very effectively amongst us even amongst those of us who are vaccinated. Now, the other thing that is critical, really critical, is share the vaccine. What we need from the international community is to genuinely ensure that the vaccines are distributed everywhere. I'm looking at the map of the, of the world. I'm looking at a map of the continent of Africa. M much of the world is green. Much of the world is getting the vaccine coverage up. Africa is still very much in the red. We need to work together. We cannot give this virus a place where it can circulate freely. We have to stop it with every tool we have. Indeed, we have to. Dr. Margaret Harris, 
It's always a pleasure talking to you. Thank you very much for talking to us here on the Newsmakers. You saw what the World Health Organization had to say about the resurgence of COVID-19 across the world. Now let's discuss it further. I'm joined now from London by Oksana Pizik. She's a biochemist and senior teaching fellow at the University College London School of Pharmacy. In New York is health economist Dr. Eric Feigelding. He is a senior fellow at the Federation of American Scientists and an expert on disease outbreaks. And in San Francisco, we have Nicholas Baylis. He is the chief technology officer at Centivax, a firm working on pre treatment to neutralize all COVID variants. Thank you very much to all of you for joining us uh, today on the program. Now, Eric, uh, let me begin with you. Despite uh, countries ramping up their vaccine campaigns, cases in some parts of the world are not dropping. In fact, Cases are exploding in countries like the United Kingdom and Russia, so certainly something is not working. What is not working? Thanks for having me. Well, obviously, I'm very worried about the UK. UK is facing several crises. One, of course, uh, they have the new Delta A4 subtype variant, which is rapidly increasing to now 10% of the population. We don't know how worrisome this is yet, but it is very worrisome in many ways. Well, Eastern Europe, meantime, has a huge problem with vaccine hesitancy as well as vaccine rollouts. And that's why Moscow has already gone into a one-week holiday. Um, and also a lot of elderly are told to stay indoors. Uh, Moscow and Russia has, uh, and many of the Balkan uh, Eastern European uh, countries have a serious problem in vaccine uptake. Uh, partly some of their own making in terms of their messaging from the government. But I think we all together, of course, need more vaccines, but we have to realize we have to mitigate plus vaccines. Relying on just vaccine one layer defense alone has shown disaster. Vaccines are great, but vaccines are not impervious, and especially Delta is much more penetrant for breakthroughs. So we have to use a multi-layer strategy, and many countries have right. completely neglected any multi-layer strategy. Right, now, Nicholas, let me come to you. So there are variants out there which can cause breakthrough infections, for example, Delta. So what kind of challenge do you think these new variants uh, pose? And, you know, people are wondering, what's the point of getting a vaccine when uh, there are mutants out there which have the capability to evade uh, antibodies in induced by vaccinations? Of course. All of these measures that we have, vaccines, masking, distancing, they all are only partially effective. And so we need to employ them all together. The vaccine, when it came out against the strains that were circulating at the time, was quite effective uh, in the 90% in the efficacy range. With the new variants, including Delta, that efficacy has dropped. And that only increases the importance of other countermeasures like distancing and masking and these temporary shutdowns that we're seeing come out now. Another important factor that's gonna come out is um, additional medicines and therapeutics against COVID-19. Uh, both small molecules that keep seeing getting approved in recent days, as well as antibody therapies. There have been um, several antibody therapies approved. Um, many of those have restrictions on when they can be given only before supplemental oxygen um, is, is needed. Most of them involve um, an IV infusion, so we think uh, as scientists and here at Centivax, we think that there are opportunities to further improve those antibody medicines, um, which will be one more countermeasure that we have against variants, including Delta. Right, now, Oksana, and then there are countries which have still not received vaccines. I want to ask you about equitable distribution of vaccines across the world. How important is it for us to ensure that each and every country across the world gets a vaccine? Well, yes, you're absolutely right. Um, less than 3% of uh, people living in low and middle income countries, and particularly in low income countries, um, have received a vaccine. So we're talking about less than 3%. Um, and as Eric has already um, highlighted how concerning variants can be, we're really creating a scenario where some of these most densely populated and highly populated regions have no access uh, to vaccine or, um, or have been uh, promised by a trickle down donation strategy, but because of boosters um, are not getting them yet. 
uh, this does mean that uh, the virus has more chance to continue to circulate um, from person to person and in that time mutate. So when we look at this as a as a long-term thing, it means that the pandemic, uh, we're prolonging it. It, it, it will. Uh, it's not realistic to say that we're going to quarter off um, such huge regions of the world and not expect it to uh, wash back on our shores. Part of the problem has been um, uh, not only the a vaccine hoarding, which has occurred by um, high-income countries, uh, it is also due to IP restrictions. And if we, at the very beginning, had allowed um, other manufacturers to team up rather than relying on two companies in the world to create um, mRNA vaccines, uh, we could have been in a better position than we are right now. 2020, we saw um, in England um, and the UK the highest number of deaths since the Spanish flu in 1918. Right. And when we consider the global population, this can, can it's like going right. into a time machine back to 2020. Right. Now, Eric, let me come to you. Now, as we speak about the resurgence of coronavirus cases across the world and vaccines, booster shots, there's another debate which is taking place in many parts of the world. Who is responsible for all these deaths? Almost 5 million people have died from COVID-19 since the pandemic began. For example, in Brazil, the president... Uh, the, the Senate of the country has recommended the president uh, uh, be, uh, be charged uh, with homicide. So is that a fair accusation? Well, I think in Brazil, uh, the air Bolsonaro has been very, very derelict and publicly endangering uh, his population especially with his dismissal of masks, his downplaying of vaccines. You know, he, his con country also late ordered a lot of vaccines and also ordered a, um, a lot of vaccines through some interesting uh, middlemen, let's just say, that did not pay fair prices. Brazil is not the model of the world, but it's not just Brazil that's seeing a really high excess. The U United Kingdom has has really really dangerous policies right and as who's has said the mass um, infection is not a strategy but that seems to be the strategy in the uk right and talking Many about the united kingdom Eric, talking about the united kingdom the, right. uh, the doctors union in the uk has accused prime minister boris johnson of yeah willful negligence oksana a fair accusation was he negligent well, it's not. I think that accusation um, also applies uh, in the current stages in terms of uh, not employing the lessons learned. Uh, there has been uh, the medical community has uh, rallied loud and clear that Plan B should have been implemented, and Plan B meaning wearing um, a face mask indoors and in in uh, public transport. Because since July in the UK, um, it's been dubbed as Freedom Day, um, where uh, nearly all restrictions. Uh, were lifted apart from some uh, around travel. So uh, I think it's the UK has, um, in this sense, interestingly, um, wavering back despite the fact that we had more lockdowns and more economic costs than other countries. Uh, and it's not just the UK that is calling for justice for the citizens um, and, and that have been um, Lot, tragically have lost their lives. We even see in France that the ex-former um, health minister uh, has also been indicted uh, due to endangering health. And uh, so th those trials will likely occur uh, all over the world um, as people are still looking for ways to protect themselves and their loved one. Right. Now, Eric, uh, let me ask you, to what extent uh, do you think we are responsible as individuals of course it's easy uh, it's easier to blame uh, governments but what responsibility do we have well i think uh, we all have the responsibility to vaccinate whenever it's offered and available as well as wearing face masks and especially more premium masks and i think a lot of the misinformation and disinformation out there there are clearly bad actors spreading it but clearly, there are a lot of people who are just completely resistant to vaccine, uh, you know, information and and also masks. And this, it, the politicization of of all this, is it due to some bad actors who spreading this information and riling up the population? But I think in the media and certain 
conservative news channels like in America. Eric, if Fox I may interject news, here, now politicization, talking about the politicization, well. we have been uh, hearing a confusing narrative coming from uh, world uh, bodies. For example, there are some institutions which are uh, advocating for a booster shot, then there are some institutions which are uh, totally against booster shots. So what exactly do we need at this point? Do we need to get a booster shot or not? Oh yeah, we definitely need booster shots. If you look at the data on the waning, the waning starts much earlier than even six months. You see it after uh, starting three months as well and drops quickly around four and five months. It's a combination of the Delta variant being more evasive, but it's also waning. So, but we know that with a booster shot, so like we've seen in Israel, you can actually reduce severe disease by 90% versus someone with two shots in six months. Versus two shots in six months, not versus no vaccine. Eric, I, I'm sorry, I have to interject really here now. Is now, I'm, I'm going to ask you as a layman, when the vaccines were still under development, the manufacturers were saying pretty much what you're saying right now, it's going to protect you more than 90%. So what I feel people might be thinking out there, these booster shots will keep popping up. There is no end to it. It's a never ending spree. Well, I think the booster shots show that the amount of antibodies and neutralization you get with a booster shot is orders of magnitude much higher than two shots. Um, and that data pans out. So I think we will be good for more than six months now with the third booster shot because the level of neutralization antibodies is so, so much higher than we've ever had before. And if it does wane, it will take a much longer time to wane after a third booster shot. All right. Now, Nicholas, uh, let me come to you. I want to broaden the discussion a bit. Like I mentioned, this pandemic has been going on for almost 18 months. There are people who are frustrated with whatever is happening across the world. So as someone who has researched on vaccines, as someone who has uh, researched on uh, providing uh, a solution to this seemingly never-ending problem, what do you think would it take for this pandemic to end? A miracle? <laughs> Um, I think a lot of people, myself included, uh, consider the rapid development of these vaccines to be some of a miracle. Um, I think that we are on the verge of turning a corner. There are a number of promising therapeutics that are on the verge of entering trials and, and getting approved. For vaccine uptake, uh, to echo what Eric said, three shots is not a unique thing just for COVID-19. Uh, many Vaccines that we got uh, in childhood, hepatitis B, for example, and many others require a three-shot series to induce long-lasting, in a lot of cases, lifetime immunity to these viruses. So it's not unusual that we would need uh, you know, a third shot, a booster shot, to, to induce that long-term immunity and prevent the waning of neutralizing antibodies. That said, these are complicated vaccines to manufacture. There have certainly been issues with IP transfer and restrictions there. But there are factories and facilities coming online every month to support expanded vaccine access. And a lot of that has been absorbed by developed countries and wealthy countries. But uh, as that capacity is now more and more uh, online, I think that we will see much, much more vaccine available uh, for worldwide use over, over the next few weeks. Or hopefully, months. hopefully. We really need that. I think you all will ag agree with me uh, on this, Oksana. Now, uh, I want to end this program on a positive uh, note. Are there still any positive signs out there? I know millions of people have already recovered from the coronavirus, but what other signs can we look for when it comes to being optimistic, being hopeful amid this pandemic? Well, certainly, I think uh, just to echo again our, our colleague's comment about how uh, quickly the vaccines uh, did become available. I also think that uh, molnupiravir, which is an antiviral um, that the U.S. Uh, FDA and MHRA are currently evaluating, uh, does have a potential to uh, curb hospitalization and could be another uh, tool in our toolkit to help prevent deaths. Um, so that's also um, a, a key part of the strategy that is preferable to something like Regeneron, which is an, inf an expensive infusion that requires administration in a hospital. So I do think that uh, technology and science is going to be the way out of this, as well as the fact that um, 
in countries that, uh, for instance, have uh, access to vaccines, there has been a, a large proportion that have been uh, willing to come forward um, and get their uh, jab. And I think that although there is a pocket of resistance, particularly amongst younger uh, people and in, in certain countries, uh, we do see that there are some strategies across Europe that has really helped with the uptake. So I think we can learn lessons um, from other countries that have nudged things along in terms of uptake of vaccination. And I really hope that by next year, we will have the manufacturing capacity um, and future investment in right. uh, low income countries so that they can also become self-reliant and make it for their own populations All in right. the future. So the idea is to remain hopeful and certainly a day would come when we can finally say that this pandemic is over. Oksana Pizik, uh, Nicholas Baylis and Eric Feigelding, thank you very much for talking to us here on The Newsmakers and thank you for watching. You can follow us on Twitter at the underscore newsmakers and be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. I'm Jafar Hasnan. See you next time.